All right, so we will continue our development on, of quantum mechanics. Um, so thus far in this course, um, we have established the uh, basis of quantum mechanics insofar as to explain that um, quantum mechanics has its origins as a purely probabilistic theory. And uh, there is no place for the classical determinism that is inherent in the treatment of uh, Newton's laws and classical mechanics or electrodynamics. So, and we've also established that central to quantum mechanics is the notion of a probability amplitude. Uh, probability amplitude is basically a number that I associate with every possible event that can occur in some particular way. And the total probability is given by the sum of all these probability amplitudes and taking the absolute square of the sum of the probability amplitudes. So in this way, the um, notions of quantum mechanics are distinct from classical mechanics. And as we demonstrated in the double slit experiment uh, in the last lecture, uh, even an experiment with what we normally think of as particles uh, leads to an interference pattern if we do not observe these particles as they proceed through slits one or slit two. Okay, so now uh, we have to uh, shift gears slightly and start discussing about how quantum mechanics is constructed and how to calculate these probabilities uh, using the laws of quantum mechanics. Okay, so after all, at the, at the, at the very end, quantum mechanics is basically an elaborate set of rules that help you calculate all these different probabilities and to understand how various things in the universe happen. So we have to be able to calculate all these probability amplitudes and all these probabilities. So let us get started with the construction of quantum mechanics. And uh, there is different ways to start introducing the subject. I will introduce the subject on the basis of certain postulates. Okay, so just like you, uh, your high school teacher introduced classical mechanics to you um, by first telling what Newton's laws are, which is the logical starting point of discussing classical mechanics. Uh, one could start quantum mechanics by discussing what the basic principles of quantum mechanics are, the principles upon which the mathematical formulation of the theory is made. So these uh, go by the name of postulates of quantum mechanics. And there's various postulates of quantum mechanics, and we will discuss them one by one, unpacking the physical content of each. And today we will get started with the first postulate of quantum mechanics, postulate one. Okay. The first postulate of quantum mechanics states that the state of a physical system is completely specified by the wave function psi of x comma t for the system. Okay, in other words, the wave function psi of x comma t contains all the information about the system. Okay, so this, there is a lot going on in this postulate and we need to clearly understand what the different uh, phrases here mean. And specifically, I, I should uh, let you know very clearly what is meant by psi of xt contains all the information about the system, okay? So we'll try to unpack this as we go. So basically the first postulate tells you that if you want to know anything at all about some physical system, so let us say that there is a bunch of gas inside a box, okay? And we want to understand the dynamics of this uh, box of gas, we have to ascribe a wave function to this box of gas that has a whole number of different molecules. And the system as a whole is described completely by this wave function. 
And whatever we want to know about the gas, we can know once we know the wave function of the gas. Then that is actually a very big statement, right? So all you have to do is calculate this one quantity and you know everything about the quantity. This is very different, for example, from classical mechanics when you have to uh, know about the position, you have to measure the position. When you have to know the momentum, you have to measure the momentum. Of course, even in quantum mechanics or classical mechanics, if you want to know the value of the dynamical quantities in an experimental setting, you should still measure them. But if you want to predict the details of the experiment, one could simply do it by simply understanding what the wave function of the system is. So I'll explain what the preceding statement is as we discuss the other postulates of quantum mechanics also. But for now, let us stick with postulate one that tells you that the state of a physical system is completely specified if I know what the wave function of the system is. Well, what does this mean? There is um, one simple interpretation to understand what the wave function could possibly mean. And before I move along, I've written psi as a function of x and t. Of course, we live in three spatial dimensions and one time dimension. So psi is a, generally a function of r vector and t. Okay? But right now, I'm inter inter interested in uh, objects in just one dimension. So um, for simplicity, we'll consider just one spatial dimension, and we will call this x. So one uh, possible way of understanding what psi of xt means from the probabilistic point of view was given by the famous scientist Max Born. Okay, and he introduced what is called the statistical interpretation of the wave function psi of x comma t. Psi of, so basically what Max Born said is as follows. Psi of x comma t is in general a complex number. But if you calculate the modulus of psi of x comma t squared dx, this quantity, this quantity, Born claims, measures the probability of finding the particle between x and x plus dx at time t. Okay, so basically the modulus square of the wave function times dx is a measure of the probability of finding the particle whose wave function is given by psi of x comma t, finding the particle between x and x plus dx, okay? Now we will go into detail about what an act of measurement constitutes in quantum mechanics later, but for now, we will take this wave function as being given to us for granted. We will later understand how to calculate the wave function, how to compute the wave function from first principles using the Schrodinger equation. But for now, we'll take the wave function for granted and we'll try and understand what to do with it, okay? So for now, our goals are very modest. We want to understand what we can do with this information. Now, obviously, if psi of x comma t quantity square dx is the probability of measuring the particle between x and x plus dx, the, the particle has to be found somewhere. So if I integrate this quantity, from minus infinity to plus infinity dx. This should measure the total probability of finding the particle between minus infinity and plus infinity. And since the particle has to be found somewhere between minus infinity and plus infinity, because it is there, I know that, this has to be equal to one. The total probability is always equal to one, okay? So a typical uh, first um, course in quantum mechanics starts by trying to ask you how to normalize a wave function. Normalizing a wave function. What does normalizing a wave function mean? Well, suppose example, suppose I tell you psi of x comma t for some system in one dimension is given by a, let us say a to the minus lambda x, uh, a to the i omega t, okay? And I say with this information, find a, the constant a. 
you'll say, ah, but I can use the statistical interpretation of the wave function modulus psi square dx is basically equal to modulus a square, the square of e to the minus lambda x is e to the minus two lambda x. The absolute square of e to the i omega t is just one. And if I integrate this quantity between minus infinity and plus infinity, I should get one because the particle has to be found somewhere. This is an integration you can easily do. And this would give you the value of a to be, I think, root lambda. This is something you should check, okay? Now, notice that this only gives you what the modulus of a is. a can still be a complex number because as I told you, the wave functions are in general complex numbers. So a, if you can choose without any problem for many cases, you can choose a to be completely real. So you can choose a to be root lambda or a can also be chosen to be something like e to the i phi root lambda, okay? Of course, we will later find out that in the calculation of all relevant physical parameters, it is the object psi square that is important, okay? Not psi itself. Uh, we will understand why this is later, but of course these phases like e to the i phi in the overall wave function can become important if you uh, look at interferences. But if you're not looking at interferences, you can safely drop this and simply choose a to be uh, a completely real parameter like root lambda. This procedure is called normalizing a wave function. Now the wave function is normalized. An equivalent statement is saying the following. We claim that psi of x comma t, oops, sorry. Psi of x comma t is square integrable. Okay, which means the integral psi square dx between minus infinity and plus infinity makes sense as an integral, okay? So for example, if I give you any physical system and I claim that psi of x comma t for this system is something of e to the alpha x where alpha is positive, then between minus infinity and plus infinity, this integral cannot be evaluated because e to the alpha x blows up as x goes to infinity. So this is an example of a wave function that is not square integral. So if you have a very simple physical system uh, whose wave function you need to figure out, such a physical system should always have a wave function that is square integrable. We'll talk more about square integrability as we move on. Okay. So we have learned that the state of a physical system, to understand the state of a physical system, you need the wave function of the system, and that mod psi square is somewhat related to the uh, probability of finding the system, finding the particle uh, um, in some region of space, okay? So since quantum mechanics is a probabilistic theory, let us take a quick uh, side tour and familiarize ourselves with the basic rules of probability. These are all things that I'm sure you know already, but I just want to revise them very quickly so that we are all on the same page as we move along, okay? So I'll call this an, uh, excuse me. I'll call this an aside, okay? If you uh, know the theory of probability very well, you can skip this uh, side probability basics, okay? So I'll take the example of a discrete probability distribution. So let us consider that there is a group of people in um, a room or a house, and let us look at their ages, okay? So let us say that there is a number of people in a room and their ages are given by, I don't know, 14, 12, 27, 27, 38, 66, 91, 12, 14, and 30. Something like this, I don't know, okay? So this is the distribution of ages of a bunch of people in a room, okay? So I'll, I'll denote by N of J the number of people with age J. Number of 
people with age j okay so in our example there is two people with age 27 there is two people with age 14 there is one guy with age 30 66 and so on and so forth so what is the probability of finding a person of a certain age j well you just need to take everybody with that age j and divide by the total number of people okay, so this is obvious the advantage of defining the probability this way is that the total probability is automatically equal to one because the total probability is simply sum over j and j over n but n is a constant so this is one over n n of j but the total number of people is always equal to n that is how we have defined this so this is simply n over n which is equal to so the total probability is equal to one because we have defined the probability of finding a person with age j as n of j over n okay. so given this information we can go ahead and calculate the average age of the people in the room okay sometimes this is also called the mean and it is denoted by putting the average age in between two angular brackets like this and this quantity is equal to the sum over j j p of j this is a very general rule of calculating averages the average of any quantity is the sum over all the quantities of that quantity multiplied by the probability uh, distribution of the quantity okay for example the average of the square of the ages again denoted by j square with an angular brackets would be given by sum over j j square p of j okay the uh, note notice that the average of any function of j f of j is given by sum over j f of j p of j okay so this is how we calculate averages once you're given a probability distribution p of j in my case i'm given a probability distribution p of j that is n of j over n that's a discrete probability distribution you can also have a continuous probability distribution p of x okay if you have a continuous probability distribution p of x you simply replace all these uh, sums by integrals and instead of p of j you write p of x so continuous case continuous distribution p of x if you have a probability distribution and i want the average of some quantity f of x i simply take f of x p of x dx and assuming that i go from minus infinity to infinity that melts from minus infinity to plus infinity uh, this is assuming the probability distribution is normalized which means p of x dx if it is equal to one then I can always calculate my averages using this particular rule, okay? So notice one important thing in our previous example of ages. The mean of the ages square is in general not equal to the mean of the age square, okay? Quantity j square is not equal to the average of j square. These two are two different quantities. And the difference between these two quantities would be relative to the st uh, st uh, standard deviation, which we will introduce as we go along. Okay. All right. So at this point, uh, let us quickly recap. Once I know the state of a physical system, I can calculate everything that I need to know about the system. Okay. Now, how I do the calculation, we will uh, we will uh, explain once I have introduced the notion of operators. But basically, once I know the state of a physical system psi of x, I know pretty much everything I need to know about the system. 
And you should be careful to note that you should only use wave functions that are square integrable in one dimension. This means that an integral of this form exists. Minus infinity to infinity mod psi square does exist. Okay. So the question that usually arises is what does this mean? So what do you mean when you say the state of a physical system is specified by the wave function? So in classical mechanics, we are not used to this notion. The classical mechanics basically tells you that if you give me what the force is, I'd be able to predict what the motion of the particle is. Right? Given the force, I can calculate the trajectory. Quantum mechanics does not answer a question like that. Quantum mechanics tells you that whatever be the force that you apply on a physical system, with that particular force acting on that physical system, I can solve for the wave function of that system. Okay, the way you would solve for the wave function of the physical system is by using what is called the Schrodinger equation. We will talk about that as we go along. But once I know what the wave function of a system is by solving the Schrodinger equation, I can go ahead and calculate the probabilities associated with all particular measurements. And I can talk about things like, for example, the average energy of the system, the average momentum, the uh, whatever it is that I actually want. But whatever I need to calculate, uh, uh, for example, when I talk about things like the hydrogen atom where uh, dynamic transitions can occur, I can also ask for questions like, what is the chance that this, this particular system will go from this state to a different state? Okay, so all these things I can actually calculate once I know what the wave function of the system is. So postulate one of quantum mechanics simply tells you that in order to be able to do anything with the system, in order to be able to measure anything or calculate the probability of anything, you ought to know the wave function of the system. So the rest of the postulates would be basically an elaboration of the statement by trying to tell you how to calculate these probabilities and we will, as we move along, we'll introduce the notion of operators and how they act on the physical system.